Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the Fragrant Bunker. Today we're gonna talk about the top 10 perfumes to start your collection with. Now this is a really interesting topic because we're gonna twist it around a little bit. Um, as you can see, well, as you're going to see throughout the video, uh, I will be talking about topics for you to kind of dip into in order to understand perfumes, especially interesting if you are a beginner. These are like your beginning sources to tap into to understand perfumes better and also to facilitate yourself in choosing the right perfumes to purchase because as we all know perfumes don't come cheap some of them d don't uh and uh it you know and it, it's happened to to the best of us you know to, to you kind of end up spending a lot of money buying a lot of different perfumes and you're not really sure if you like them or not and it can be a really 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 expensive rabbit hole to go down if you're not a little bit more precise with what you really like. So I'm going to offer you these kind of 10 topics that uh, I personally always go through when I'm deciding what perfume to buy next. And also these 10 topics will in include fragrances as well. So we will be touching base on perfumes too. But it's kind of always 10 topics to bear in mind when you are thinking uh, about beginning a collection or expanding your collection. But this is particularly interesting for beginners, for those people who are just discovering perfumes for the first time and are falling in love with the world of fragrances and want to um, understand more about them. Because it's not an easy world to get into. I mean, it's easy to just smell a perfume and either you like it or you don't like it. It's that simple. Yes, I agree. It is that simple. But then once you start understanding, well, there's more to it, you know, there's the olfactive families, there's the different concentrations, the flankers, the history, the reformulations, like, oh my God, it can drive you insane. So let's get to, to these lists. First, subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. If you haven't already, you can also join me on Patreon, Super Decab all spelled together for extra perks. Uh, thank you to all my patrons who have already pledged. So now let me tell you, I begin with uh, the concentrations and I always like to explain that concentrations are not flankers. <laughs> All right, so what are concentrations? Well, and also concentrations don't always mean, oh, eau de toilette is lighter than an eau de parfum. They're different. And the best example of differences, I'm gonna show you here, the extrait, the parfum, we have the example of Chanel number no. five, almost empty here. I have the spray bottle as well, but anyway. Then we have the, Eau de Parfum, concentration, also same perfume, Chanel number no. 5, but smells different, slightly different. Then we have a twist and spray Eau de Toilette of Chanel number no. 5. Uh, this one, you kind of twist it, it opens up. Uh, then Chanel used to also come as an Eau de Cologne. Uh, then there are in-between iterations of concentrations like L'Eau, uh, Eau Première. You could call them flankers, but in reality... Well, one bottle just fell, uh, but uh, it did not spill, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there are different uh, concentrations still. You could call them flankers maybe, but they're not low. Let's just say low is uh, an eau de toilette, iteration of an eau de toilette. But let's just stick to the main ones. Parfum slash extrait. Parfum or extrait is the same thing. Eau de Parfum is the water of the Parfum. They call it the more diluted version of the Parfum. Then you have the Eau de Toilette, which is like the water of for the bathroom, Eau de Toilette. And then you have the Eau de Cologne, Cologne, which is a lighter version. Now, i taking Chanel number no. 5 as an example in particular to prove my point being not uh, every concentration has to be lighter than the next, meaning the Eau de Toilette doesn't have to be lighter than an Eau de Parfum. The Eau de Cologne doesn't have to be necessarily weaker than the Eau de Parfum. In fact, uh, the Chanel Eau de Cologne, when it was in production, it's been discontinued, it, very heavy on the civet, very intense smell. The Eau de Cologne of number no. five was not a fleeting, light, breezy perfume that was gone five minutes after you applied it. No, it would stick around for hours, actually projecting much more than the parfum, the extrait of Chanel number no. 5, which when it dries down on the skin, it stays much more intimate and close to the skin, projecting less. So, technically, uh, you have to understand 
that concentrations, the higher the concentration of essential oils or of fragrance as opposed to water and alcohol, the higher the concentration, the more it's going to cost. The perfume is going to cost more. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to last longer smell-wise, projection-wise, longevity-wise, right? So bear that in mind. And also, don't think that just because, well, okay, it fell down, but here's another bottle. I have a 22. <laughs> Let's, let's drop this one as well. But if we ever have Chanel number 22, so uh, if you, 15 ml costs a lot, but it's an intimate gesture. You apply it on your pulse points. You just smell it for yourself. It's a whole other experience. And uh, no perfume collection is complete without at least one or two extras in your collection. So if you're going to begin a perfume collection, bear in mind, you should definitely, definitely have, at least from one perfume you love, as many different concentrations as possible just to understand the variety of it. Chanel Number no. 5 Eau de Toilette is a much more floral experience, like a powdery floral exper experience, or a green floral experience, really, uh, than uh, the Extrait, for example. So... Bear that in mind, concentrations, step number one. Number two is uh, you should definitely understand the difference between reformulations. So I always say try to get into your collection a vintage OG formula of a fragrance and the current formula of a fragrance. Obviously, try to get them from perfumes you love. In my case, I have an example for you here. In my case, that would be Poison by Christian Dior. I adore Poison. Gorgeous, plummy tuberose. Uh, dangerous, dark, plummy tuberose. This is the first iteration, the mid-80s Eau de Toilette. And now I, and I also have the current version, uh, also Eau de Toilette in a different bottle, bottle that resembles the Esprit de Parfum. Don't get confused. <laughs> They're still both Eau de Toilette. But you have the current version of Poison Eau de Toilette, and you have the OG version of Poison Eau de Toilette. Interesting to have at least one of these examples in your collection. Just to bear in mind and to always remind yourself how uh, perfumes evolve, how they change. Um, this is an interesting example because Poison is a very synthetic perfume. It does have a natural ingredients in it as well, but it's a perfume that, uh, despite it being 30, 40, 50 years old at a certain point, it doesn't... Um, turn sour or bad, especially in the spray versions. In the splash versions, depending what bacteria came into it, it might go sour or stale. But in the spray iteration, every vintage bottle I bought was always perfect. Granted, it's an authentic one. Obviously, be very careful. Don't, you know, do your due diligent research. And uh, there's a lot of replicas out there. Now, uh, I recommend Poison because it's a particularly interesting transformation. How the brand invested money for the launch of the perfume. What a and boy, what a launch it was. And then how they've kind of reduced it to just one version now. Like Poison only gives us eau de toilette. There's no more other concentrations today uh, by Dior. Poison does also not deliver any shower gels, bath, nothing. The flankers of it do, you know, hypnotic poison. It, is, is selling better than original poison, so they do still make uh, shower gels and all that stuff. But uh, you need to have, as point two on this list, at least one vintage versus new of the same perfume, just to understand how these perfume houses evolve. You know, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worst. Uh, in the case of poison, unfortunately for the worst, it's just, uh, it's not as sophisticated, rich and opulent and quality-wise as deep as it used to be. But it's good to have an example like this in your collection so that you understand how much in just several years or decades uh, perfumes can change because the brands reformulate them. Whether it be because IFRA is giving you regulations on ingredients becoming illegal or not, you know, whatever, or you have to use them in more limited quantities, or just because the brand, well, isn't earning any more money with a perfume, so they're kind of trying to find ways to make it cheaper so that they can maximize their profits. But it's good to have an example like this so that you understand uh, how a perfumery works and how it kind of, how the business of it evolves. And uh, most of the times to the detriment of the consumer. Point three, 
Ah, this is an interesting point. I wrote down here, um, it's important to learn and appreciate the, in surface, more simple perfumes, appearing simpler. And th those would be the colognes. Okay. Usually when you're on your discovery journey of, a, of, of the perfume world, the first stuff you encounter or the first perfumes that kind of hit you are the intense ones, the strong ones, the woodsy ones, the ones that show a lot of character, the ones that scream into your face like Coromandel from Chanel or Poison from Dior. But my point three on, on my list here, very important, is to never, it's important to learn and to appreciate the subtle masterful art of Cologne, of bergamot, of lemon, of lime. And uh, Cologne 4711, 4711 is a very, very um, um, affordable option. It is one of the oldest colognes out there. You could get it in many drugstores. Uh, 4711 or 4711 Cologne uh, from Cologne. You see, that's kind of where it was born. The concept of Cologne uh, water was born in the city of Cologne in Germany. And you have, you can buy even like a liter bottle of that one and it's relatively affordable. You can also buy tiny ones and just freshen up. And it's a citrusy accord, a bergamot accord. Cologne is a light fresh smell. And there's masterful renditions of Cologne. Mugler did a wonderful Cologne. Chanel, in their Les Exclusives range, also delivers a gorgeous Cologne. I have here the Eau de Cologne by Chanel with a hint of vanilla in the dry down. Oh my gosh, how much I love this perfume. I mean, and it's, it's one of the fragrances you discover last within the range of Chanel perfumes of the Les Exclusives because it's the one that is most silent. And I always say, in your perfume collection, if you're starting a collection, very important to at least have a couple of colognes. They don't have to be as expensive as this one. They can also be the 4711. But to understand the art of cologne in perfumery is a very important, very important. Don't underestimate it. And every good perfumer prides themselves in having at least one cologne designed by them because it's it's kind of like a signature thing you know every perfumer wants to have at least one cologne fragrance in their repertoire uh, because everybody wants to tackle the concept of cologne everybody wants to deliver oh my gosh this one is beautiful by the way they're light they're always bergamotty citrusy lemony very ethereal um these smells that smell of just clean and evaporate very quickly. It gives you a feeling of dryness, particularly good in summer. You always need a cologne in your collection. Don't forget that. And now my point four being flankers. Okay, now flankers are super important to understand, especially because you have to understand the strategy. The strategy of brand marketing. Flankers are usually... Um, new iterations of a fragrance that's already popular. The brand has already invested a lot of money. Biggest example, for example, is Coco Mademoiselle. Coco Mademoiselle uh, was a huge success when it was released. It started the whole trend of the fruit chulis, like the fruity patchoulis, very Y2K era. It's become an icon in its own right, a classical perfume to be considered nowadays. Coco Mademoiselle has seen many flankers come out. When the flankers come out, Chanel does not need anymore to invest millions in brand marketing because they capitalize on the fact that you already know Coco Mademoiselle, right? They've already spent money to advertise for Coco Mademoiselle years ago, and they still reinvest in advertising for Coco Mademoiselle. Uh, but when they release a flanker, they don't spend a lot of money in advertising for the flanker because it's kind of more word of mouth and they already know that they have a ton of fans of people who repurchase Coco Mademoiselle over and over and over again. So when they release, every year they release a flanker. Sometimes it's a limited edition, which makes you even FOMO even more. But when they release a flanker, they capitalize on the fact that the fans of the perfume are going to buy the flanker because they're going to want an, a different iteration of the of the original. So Coco Mademoiselle has Coco Mademoiselle Intense, Coco Mademoiselle Au Privé to go to bed with, Coco Mademoiselle Low, which was a limited edition, like a body spray a couple of summers ago. Um, uh, they keep coming out with new ones and then sometimes they discontinue them as well. So whenever they come out with a new flanker, you you kind of rush to buy it. I love Coco Mademoiselle, so I, I'm, I'm that sucker. I'm the one. I'm also the victim. I mean, I love my Chanel perfumes in general, but I go and I buy it. Now, usually a flanker 
saves the brand some money. I mean, maximizes profits because the flankers are usually more watered down. They're a more lighter version of the brand, except with Mugler, we have experienced other iterations, like when they did uh, flankers of womanity with a leather accord, a leather tincture, or was it a tobacco tincture? Like those particular flankers uh, had uh, more intensity to them. But usually when a mass-released perfume uh, is very successful, and then the brand issues a flanker, the flanker will have a lighter nuance, a lighter facet to it. For example, I have here, in the early 90s, uh, Moschino came out with a Cheap and Chic, this olive oil Popeye's girlfriend uh, shaped bottle, which I love. Uh, it's one of the most iconic perfume bottles ever designed. I really adore it. Uh, it's a it's a gorgeous cyclamen accord. So this one was highly successful when it first came out. And then its flanker came out. Here it is. It's a, it's a slightly smaller bottle. It's blue. I have a blue screen on, so it appears transparent, but it's blue with orange. And it's called uh, Cheap and Chic I Love Love. This is a flanker of this one, right? So it's a lighter version of Cheap and Chic. Cheap and Chic is intense, more powerful, more deep. The flanker is going to have more fresh accord, slightly easier for them to compose. Not a lot of money was invested in it. The bottle is the same, just a different print, different color. So they didn't have to pay Euro Italia or whoever to design a new bottle. Sure, they had to design a new colorway, but it's the same. So you see what I mean? A flanker is there to maximize and also boost profits for the brand. This doesn't mean that every flanker is bad. Not at all. Actually, I Love Love is a gorgeous flanker. But I'm just saying, you have to understand it. Don't fall completely victim to flankers, because it is part of a brand strategy to maximize their profits. Not necessarily, they're, they're not making flankers because they do believe that flankers are going to be better than the OG. No. Flankers are usually made just for money. Not so much artistry goes into the flankers, in my opinion, than goes into the original releases. So that was the flanker uh, point. Now, uh, another thing to understand, five, point five, when you're starting a perfume collection, really, really important, is to understand the synthetics. And I always talk about synthetics because I do believe that synthetics in perfumery are the imminent future. Actually, it's already happening now. Uh, to understand synthetics is really important. Um, I, you know, the biggest example of, of synthetics in uh, modern day perfumery for me uh, is uh, Thierry Mugler's Alien, Angel, uh, or the male counterpart, Amen, uh, or um, Womanity, um, also his last perfume, Aura. Aura is also a very synthetic fragrance. Uh, you have to understand synthetics because more in, they're entering more and more and more into our daily lives, well, food, clothing, computers, uh, but uh, also perfumes, creams, um, you know, skincare, cosmetics, makeup. And you have to have at least one synthetic fragrance in your collection, like highly synthetic fragrance in your collection. Uh, another one that I have in my collection is the Comme des Garçons tape. I think it's maybe perhaps even the best example of a very synthetic. It has hawthorn in it, but the description of the perfume itself is like a tape, sticky tape, uh, or a box, a computer box from the 80s that you opened up and that smell of fresh of a fresh computer, or like if you open a Nintendo, that smell of that plastic and the digital part of it, the mechanical part of it, that smell, plus office tape or just packing tape, that smell, that synthetic smell of tape mixed with a bit of Hawthorne is in Comme des Garçons perfume called Comme des Garçons, sub subtitled tape. It comes in this crumpled bottle that can't stand up. It just kind of falls also very synthetic, like not 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 functioning fully in this world. It's a beautifully conceptual perfume. Uh, I have it in my archives. And, uh, and I have it not because I want to wear it all the time, but I have it as an olfactive reference because it is important to have it as a reminder that synthetics are here to stay and they're going to become more and more dominant. Now, people can perfect synthetics more and more with time. We can, we can even, you know, we're capable more and more and more in perfumery to, to copy natural smells uh, and make 
listen, even diamonds, you know, now people are talking about the um, artificially cultivated diamonds, which they say are virtually indistinguishable from the millions of years old generating diamonds, the natural ones. Uh, you could just chemically copy anything nowadays, and the more time progresses and the more we will be able to copy everything. So, so yes, we are already in the era of synthetic perfumes, but just to have a reminder about that, to understand your perfumes even more, get yourself at least one highly synthetic perfume in your collection to have as a reference point. My suggestion would be Comme des Garçons tape or any Teddy Mugler fragrance. Because the Teddy Mugler fragrances, if you like them, you can actually wear them. I've only known two people thus far that really wear on a daily basis Comme des Garçons tape. It takes some getting used to. Let's just put it that way. So synthetics was 0.5. 0.6. Uh, always important to understand your drugstore quality perfume as opposed to high quality perfumery. Let's say niche, maybe even certain niches are also relatively poor quality, but other niches are not. And when, when I talk about niche, I'm talking about high quality niche. So drugstore quality, I have an example here. Uh, you know, celebrity perfumes. It can be your Ariana Grande, your Britney Spears, whatever have you. I have a Dita Fontise uh, erotique uh, fragrance here. Uh, as you can see, I have used it. Uh, so I have a drugstore uh, perfume from Dita Fontise erotic with a little a charm, a key and a lock. This one has been discontinued. Meh, you know what I mean? it's a drugstore perfume. It's very synthetic. It's the cheapest ingredients are in here, but it's interesting. It's interesting to smell this and then compare it to, let's say, a very high class, high quality niche gardenia like Isabe. So here we have Isabe's gardenia in this gold fingerprint magnet bottle. This thing is like butter. Smooth, honey. This thing smells opulent, rich. This is like the epitome of expensive ingredients in a perfume. And this is the epitome of cheap ingredients in a perfume using a big name to sell them. So drugstore slash celebrity perfumes as opposed to your really high class niches. Have at least one of each in your collection. Uh, really important to understand the difference between the two. I'm not saying that these two perfumes smell alike. They don't. They have two different olfactive families. It doesn't matter. I just chose both of them as an example of product, not as an example of actual smell, right? To have and understand the drugstore perfume and to have and understand high quality niche is an art. It doesn't take much to understand the difference in quality because if you've, your entire life, if you've um, only dealt with drugs or perfumes, you might think, well, they're, they're great. But once you've kind of smelled also higher quality ingredients, I don't want to say there's no going back because there are still some gorgeous drugstore fragrances out there. But once you understand how high quality ingredients smell, and also once you understand, once you can sniff out high quality composition and a masterful elegant composition of ingredients and how they mesh together nicely. Once you've understood that, once your nose can decipher that, then there's no going back to the quickly, cheaply composed concoctions. But it's good to know the difference between the two. And this is why I say have two so that you can compare them, sniff them and learn the differences. Now, of course, you're going to say that's so snob of you and elitist. Not everybody has the money to buy these. Well, we're going to get to the solution to that problem as well in this video. Stay tuned. Uh, point seven. So point six, the drugstore quality versus high niche quality. I also wrote down to understand the difference between quality uh, and ingredients quality. Point seven, uh, really important, the history uh, and, and the olfactive evolution for older brands. Uh, very interesting to understand the history and evolution of society through perfumes, how perfumes used to smell as opposed to how they smell today. And especially interesting in brands that have been around for hundreds of years that have tackled a fragrance 100 years ago and then re-envisioned it for modern times. And to understand the history of a perfume, where it comes from, why does it smell in a certain way in any given time, and how did it evolve? So I have a wonderful example here uh, of uh, Chanel Bois des Îles from the 20s. 
and uh, it's a sandalwood uh, aldehydic fragrance. It's kind of like the woodier version of Chanel Number no. Five. People call it, but the more you wear uh, Bois de Zil, and the less it smells of Chanel Number no. Five. Really, it's it's the aldehydes in the beginning that make you. Oh, I'm layering it now with the Eau de Cologne. Oh my God, to die for. Okay, so anyway, Bois de Zil twenties fragrance. You have to understand uh, France in the twenties. The 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 uh, need for the exotic. Uh, the Black Review, Josephine Baker, there was this upset. I know a lot of it is cancelable today, and a lot of it is really politically not correct today, but you have to understand history. Um, Josephine Baker was a sensation in Paris. You know, Black culture, music, they, you know, it was, it was named exotic. All of these words are, of course, I know, completely uh, not politically correct anymore today. But this perfume was born then. And Bois des Îles means uh, the woods of the, of the islands or the forest of the islands. It's like going to faraway places where you dream about something different than what was Europe back in the 20s. So this was born out of a need to discover, yes, also a colonialistic past. Uh, it's a troubled past, for sure, uh, and a lot of it bad, but there's a beauty in the smell of it, right? But then Chanel re-envisions Bois des Îles for modern times, and this is why I'm taking, taking this as an example for you to understand your history, because point seven is history and olfactive evolution for older brands. And we have its mo modern 90s counterpart, which is Egoist, right? We have Egoist, which is kind of the small brother slash sister of Bois des Îles. They kind of come from the same family. This one from the 20s, this one from the 90s. This uh, Bois des Îles uh, re-envisioned for the 90s is egoist. And to smell the two side by side, to smell out the differences between them, makes you understand more the times you're living in. This is why I say, as point seven, always important to have in your collection at least one perfume from a brand that's been around for a long time, a perfume that has gone through an evolution of some sorts, either where the brand re-releases a fragrance or releases a fragrance with a new name with a tweak in the formula, sometimes even maintaining the same formula, just changing... Uh, maintaining the same name, pardon me, but just tweaking the formula. Guerlain comes to mind uh, when they released Liu. Liu was meant to be kind of a dupe to Chanel Number no. 5. Liu, coincidentally, is still in production today, went through a ton of reformulations. If you can hunt yourself down a vintage bottle of Liu and hunt down a new one, uh, there's a big difference between the two. Not just because the other one is very old and the top notes might be gone. No, also the fact that they are composing it differently today. But it's even better if you manage to find a, a fragrance within a brand like Chanel that actually, where they started off with one and then they kind of went into a whole other direction as an evolution of the OG. The OG is also still in production, by the way. You can still get Bois de Zille in their Les Exclusives range. Both of these egoist and Bois de Zille are amazing. Egoist came out with a flanker called Egoist Platinum, but Platinum Egoist is very different from Egoist. I don't really recommend Platinum, not my favorite perfume. But Egoist uh, is amazing. So there's that, to understand the history and the evolution. Another thing I uh, highly recommend um, as point eight, and here is where we get the answer to that point where I was telling you, buy yourself at least one niche. And if you can't afford it, niche, high class niche compared to drugstore perfume. And I said, to understand it, you don't need much money. And this is where point eight comes to, to fruition. And that would be the magical word, samples. Some brands are going to sell them to you, but most brands will give them to you for free. If you are living particularly in a city where there are a lot of perfume stores, you can enter and ask for samples. Some will give you samples for free. Some will... Not. Some will charge you outright for the sample, and that's it. Other brands are going to charge you for the sample, and they're going to tell you, bring back the uh, your the bill. Because if you end up buying this perfume in a full-size bottle, we will deduct the price of the sample. So if you paid $5 for the sample, and then you really love the perfume, then you go back to the store and you actually buy the full bottle, they will then, with the if you come back with your proof of purchase of the sample, they will deduct the price of the sample. Some some stores do it, not all stores. Some perfumeries do that. I think that's kind of cool. Uh, 
but uh, best is if they give you the samples for free, obviously. And uh, never, and I always say this, never underestimate the power of samples. So I have here uh, a bunch of Chanel Les Exclusives. So when a bottle of Chanel Les Exclusives, you know, 200 ml, a bottle of this is going to cost you, well, not Eau de Cologne, but uh, let's say Chanel Bois de Zille is going to cost you over $400. It's going to cost you like 400 with tax, 430, 440. But the sample is for free, you see. So, uh you get 1.5 ml in a little sprayer bottle. Sometimes they also give you 4 ml splash bottles, but here we have Sycamore 1957, Le Lyon, Gardenia. I also have Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton gives us 2 ml samples, sprays. I have Meteor as an example. You can get that in the Louis Vuitton shops. And I have a Dior Collection Privé. I have a Gris Dior, also 2 ml sample. Also, to buy these full bottles, super expensive. I, these are not niche. This is kind of mass release niche. These are multinational corporations, these brands. They try to sell these perfumes as niche. They're not really niche, but you, you get the gist. I mean, also Isabe does samples. They're harder to get, but you can get samples of perfumes. Uh, you don't need to buy the full-blown bottle to have these more high class niches uh, with better ingredients so that you can sniff them out and understand them as opposed to the quality of drugstores. So samples are my number eight. Really, really important to have samples in your collection and don't be afraid to use them. I know people tend to then start collecting samples and end up never using them. It's a pity. You should use them. They're amazing. Also great for travel. So you don't have to take a full bottle with you when you're traveling. You take the little one. Now, uh, point number nine super important, um, flowers. Flowers are the base of perfumes. I mean, sure, fruits as well, but uh, flowers are kind of what you envision when you think of a perfume. You think of smelling a rose and the rose smells so good. So perfume, flowers and perfumes go hand in hand. This is a more classical approach to perfumery. There are perfumes that have no flowers in them, for sure. There's a lot of experimental perfumes out there that have no flowers in them, also no woods in them. But I'm talking about the more classical approach to perfumery, flowers. And I always recommend to have some uh, floral perfumes in your collection. Now, to, uh, to know which one to get, you first have to know which flower you like the most on your skin. I'm particularly drawn to white florals, especially tuberose, gardenia, jasmine. A jasmine is almost in every perfume anyway, so it's not like hard to find a jasmine scent. But... Um, White florals, what did I write here? Flowers in general are important for perfume history. Yes, try to understand which flower or flower combo you like to smell the most on your skin. And once you know that, go for it. I particularly love Patricia Nicolai's uh, number one intense, a tuberose heavy fragrance. Uh, also, I, I adore Carnal Flower, another tuberose heavy fragrance uh, from Frédéric Mal by Dominique Ropion. I love Pure Poison, also Dominique Ropion co-made Pure Poison by Dior. Coincidentally, though, the original formula, not the current version of the formula. This is where, again, we go back to point two, OG vintage versus new current formulation. Uh, I always try to hunt down the first batches of Pure Poison. It's a beautiful gardenia, gorgeous gardenia. So understand your flowers. Understand which flower you like the most for you. And look at perfumes that have that flower in them as a base, as a structural, as a structural base for you. Not necessarily a base of the perfume, but for you, like a building block to build on top of. Because then you can evolve from there and expand. You begin from a point. I usually begin with a flower. And then I build on top of that. I go into the roots of the perfume or I go into the top notes of the perfume. Flower for me is usually heart of the fragrance. And then top notes are the more the citruses and stuff. And then the bottom notes are, are the woods. Which brings me to point number 10. The woodsy aspect. And under woods, I also listed here to make it simpler because we are, you know, here making a list for beginners. Woods, resins, musks, and animals. Uh, sandalwood, cedar, tobacco, oud, leather accord, oak moss, patchouli, musk, civet, castor oil. Uh, now, these come from different families, obviously. Sandalwood is a wood. Oud, technically, well, it's like a mushroom, I guess. 
oak moss is a lichen. It lives on wood. Uh, patchouli is a, is, a, is a plant, but it has the kind of a earthy accord. So it's a woodsy accord for me. Whether by wood, I don't necessarily just mean the trunk of the wood. I also mean foresty, woodsy, mossy, earthy tones, right? Vetiver as well uh, belongs to that family. Cedar wood. Tobacco also is a plant that has a very woodsy, dark, deep accord. Uh, leather accord. And, and then the animals, uh, the musk, which is completely synthetic now, civet, which also has been substituted by synthetics, castor uh, also, uh, ambergris as well. Now, the a, lo a lot of these are not considered woodsy accords, don't get me wrong, but under the category of woods, I just want to say you have to have fragrances in your collection. Here's a really good example. Sandalo by Lorenzo Villoresi. Uh, again, I'm using blue screen, so the bottle appears transparent and also dusty. I haven't used it in a while. Ah, what a beauty. Now, to understand what I want to say here, okay, you have to envision it this way. We had the colognes on our list, and that was the ethereal top notes of a perfume. And we spoke about the importance of colognes. Then we went into the floral accords, which is the base, which is the heart, sorry, the heart of perfumes, and really important to understand your flowers and which ones you love for yourself. For yourself. And then you got the base notes. So under woods, I have planted all of the base notes. And so for woods, I mean more like entering into the dark side of the perfume, which is the dry down of the perfume. Interesting to have in your collection at least one or two perfumes that are very heavy on these base notes so that you can understand, are you the type of person who's more into these darker base notes or are you the type of person that's more into these lighter cologne notes or are you the type of person who's more into that midsection, mid-portion floral uh, aspect of perfumery? I have realized for myself that I tend to be more that heart uh, perfume lover. I love my florals. I love the white florals very, very much. However, that's not to say that I don't tackle into uh, woodsier accords. I love my sandalwoods as well, Bois des Îles. I love Au Noir by Christian Dior. I adore Au Noir, which is very licorice based, but it also has the immortel. Uh, it has the fennel. It has burnt woods in there as well. Um, but I don't really go for ouds, so I'm not a type of person that's in love with ouds. So, you know, to smell out these woods in terms of base notes of fragrances and understand what's the type of base you like for yourself is really important But it can because it can save you a lot of money. Buying oud is very expensive, especially pure ouds. I mean, almost impossible to get. Not impossible, but really expensive. If you know that you're not into ouds, you can save yourself a lot of money. You see what I mean? Uh, being very clear and precise about what you like means you have knowledge and you need the knowledge in order to know what you like because there's a lot of perfumes out there. So this was my top 10 list of the top 10 perfume categories, right? Uh, that uh, you need to really, really master in order to initiate a proper healthy perfume collection for yourself. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Which points would you add or take away? Uh, I think this is a really interesting conversation because usually when people make top 10 lists or top five lists, it's always kind of just the perfumes listed. But I thought to myself, well, let's make a list for people who are just like starting out with perfumes and they want to kind of, they're confused about all of this. What does this all mean? The, the, the lingo, we, we just covered the basics here. Let's be very clear about that, obviously. But... It's kind of a great beginner's list, I believe. I thought long about this uh, list and how I structured it. And I think it's a great thing for beginners who are starting to learn about perfumes to kind of tackle this list and uh, it will help you out in the future. What are your guys' thoughts? Let me know down below. Love you loads. Never give up on love and subscribe.